A big thank you to Lemon Fresh Man, American Splendor, Lufobi, Blodgett, JXDXBX, and Early Underscore Man. They are maybe bizarre sounding names, but they're the reviewers that have reviewed this show so far on iTunes. If you open up iTunes, search for the Marketplace of Ideas and click on the icon, you'll find a page where you can do the same. You can submit a review and a star rating. You can say what you like about the show, what you dislike, what you want to hear more of, what you want to hear less of, what have you, things like that. And with every review, view we get the show improves in profile and thus we can improve the show make it stronger faster smarter deeper etc etc any adjective you want it to be it'll help on our goal to reach 10,000 subscribers in 2011 more details on that next time but for now you can add your rating and your review to the marketplace of ideas webpage on itunes and i will thank you if you do this week on the marketplace of ideas we'll talk to chris gillibo blogger entrepreneur and Nonconformist. It's the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm Colin Marshall. Chris Gillibo is a blogger, entrepreneur, world traveler, liver of the unconventional life, and now the author of a book called The Art of Nonconformity, Set Your Own Rules, Live the Life You Want, and Change the World. Chris, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Colin. Now, this is the question I think anybody who reads your book is going to ask you first, which is, how many countries are you up to? Uh, right now I'm up to, I think it's 151. So it's kind of funny because actually in the book, I think it's outdated now. The book says 125, but I'm, I'm at 151 now and I've actually surrendered my passport for the next four months. Um, so that I can go around America and talk about the book. But then, uh, you know, next year I'll be getting back out on the road. This is a question to explain to the listener who might not know. You have this mission to get to 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 all 192, I believe, or 193 countries before your 35th birthday. And you mention it in the book, and now you, you you talk about surrendering your passport for four months and, you know, kind of getting to know you through the book and through the blog. I feel like that is a painful thing for you to do, to surrender a passport. Am I right about that? Yes, that's correct. Um, I'm out on the road constantly and uh, usually in about 20 different countries a year. So yes, to, uh, to surrender the passport uh, is, was a big decision, but hopefully it'll be worth it. One of the elements of this, of this unconventional life, of the nonconformist life I talk about you as living, is that you do travel so much. And you know, you've got this goal of getting to all the countries and you talk about so many of your travel experiences in the book and on the blog. And that seems to be one of the main things that draws people to you that has gotten you such an audience, such you know, followers, such a social movement, if you want to call it, specifically that, the traveling part. Why do you think that's so resonant? I think it's because when you ask people, what would you do with your life if, if time and money were no object? Like, what would you like to do more of? Um, I would say almost a majority of people identify travel as something they would do more. Um, they might not do it as much as I do. They might not be interested in going to every country in the world. But I found when you talk to people about those big, like, you know, life dreaming questions, um, people always identify travel as something that they would like to do, whether it's just a, a trip here and there or somewhere they've always wanted to go or whether it's backpacking or some other kind of experience, I think people are drawn to travel and they, they like the idea of being able to, to do more of it and to have more freedom that way. And you do mention in the book that sort of even, even those who don't think they're that travel inclined probably have at least one or two countries they would want to go to. And I imagine people talking to you, they, they ask you about your traveling experiences, about how you've managed to do all this traveling. And how much of it is for them, for these people, do you think a question of logistically, financially, technically, how do you travel so much? And how much of it is a question of how do you kind of get into the mindset where you give yourself permission to travel so much, if that makes any sense? Yeah, it does make sense. And I, and I think uh, it depends on who you're talking to. I think, you know, probably the audience listening to this interview, as well as the audience of people, you know, who read my blog or the book, I think, you know, most of us are relatively privileged, uh, even if we're not you know, wealthy compared to our neighbors in America or, or elsewhere, I think most of us do have the opportunity to, to travel at least somewhat. So I think, I think it's more of a question of, of mindset and priorities and values. Um, I don't necessarily think everyone should have the value of travel or everyone should prioritize that. But, 
I think sometimes there's a disconnect when people say um, they like the idea of traveling, they would like, like to do it more, but they just feel like they can't. I think almost the logistics are almost are easier to kind of reconcile than, than the mindset. Once somebody really decides they want to do something, once they really identify, like, I've always wanted to go to Paris, I've always wanted to go to Thailand or whatever, then I don't think it's that that difficult to kind of back it up and look and see, like, how can we make that possible? How much money do you need? You know, can we set a goal of doing that in a year or so? So I think it's it's first mindset and then second logistics. Some of the other planks of nonconformity you describe in the book, they include working for yourself, starting your own businesses, doing these sorts of things that require a lot of energy on one's own part, on one's own part and not a lot of not a lot of institutional guidance. So how much how how similar are they traveling and all the rest of it, traveling and working for yourself, traveling and starting your own business? Are these are these activities, are these pursuits that require the same sort of shifts in mindset for people, do you think? Well, I think they're certainly related, and I think I think a lot of people are interested in in um, in, in the whole thing, the whole movement of of location independence, um, the idea that you can you know travel as much as you work and still maintain a career. Um, that's what I've done, and there's a lot of other people doing it. Um, so I, I think yes, first of all, it is mindset. I think some people will be attracted to some parts of it and not to others. Um, I do have a, a a big part of the audience that actually doesn't care much about travel. And I also have a big part of the audience, uh, you know, that are pretty comfortable in traditional jobs, not really seeking, you know, to be entrepreneurs or start a business, but they're, you know, attracted to the idea of doing something different uh, or the idea of kind of pursuing a different sort of dream. So I would say like, you know, as I've kind of gone through the project, I, I've learned to, you know, maybe stop applying what I think is best for everyone and, you know, try to look at what the core motivations are and how, how to help people do whatever it is that they want to do, whatever is most meaningful to them. And I want to know a little more about your starting the whole project as far as the context you were starting it in, because this whole phenomenon of people writing on on the net, especially about what they call lifestyle design, about about living unconventionally, about traveling a lot, there's kind of a not necessarily a trend, but there is a group of of people on the net that a lot of there are a lot of readers for, and this seems kind of like a new invention of our era. How much of that was going on when you first started? Well, I started um, kind of doing my own thing probably more than ten years ago. So at the time, I don't think there was uh, there was a big move, and I don't think really blogs blogs were just getting started then. So I started just out of my own you know my own desire first of all to be self employed because I wasn't a very good employee. I learned, and then. Uh, <laughs> You know, a couple of years after that, um, we, I had a 9-11 story and was feeling depressed after 9-11 like everyone else and ended up moving to West Africa and volunteered for, for a medical charity for four years. And then after I came back to the States, um, I did grad school. And it was kind of out of, out of all these, these combination of experiences of, of being an entrepreneur, of traveling a lot in West Africa, then starting the, the goal of visiting every country in the world. That's kind of how, how at least my role in the, in the whole thing came about. But yes, there's certainly many other people that are writing about the, the topic of pursuing your dreams, about travel, about uh, different kinds of work. And, and I think it's great. I think a, a lot of people have different perspectives, and that's, that's very healthy. It's good. So you got, this, you got these ideas that you would act on about how you wanted to live your own life, how you wanted to do things differently, and how, how you wanted not to conform. How did you come to the point where you realized this could resonate with other people and you could make something to connect with other people, showing how you live and how you got to live the way you live? Well, after I came back from Africa, uh, I relocated to Seattle and I was doing a grad program at the University of Washington. And throughout that two-year experience, I was kind of kind of thinking ahead and, and trying to decide, like, uh, what's the next step for me? I feel like I've done a lot of different things. I've, had, I've been fortunate to have a number of, of broad, different experiences, um, but there's really not a convergence point to it. And there's nothing that connects all these things. And I feel like maybe I've helped people on an individual basis, like from working in West Africa or helping different entrepreneurs and small business owners. Um, but, but I don't have a platform. I don't have a way to help people on a broader basis. And I also wanted to write a book, but then I realized like, who's, who's going to let me write a book? Like <laughs> I've done all these things, but if you, if you Google my name, there's like 10 results, you know? Um, so basically it was out of a, kind of a two year, uh, two year process of thinking through like, how can I establish a platform? What is it that I really want to say? Like, what is the core message that definitely took a long time to, to kind of figure out. Um, and then, in 2008, I started the blog, The Art of Nonconformity, and this kind of kind of went from there. But I definitely thought about it for a long time before I did it. 
There's this word you've used in the last answer there, convergence, and it fascinates me the way that you use this word, the way I've seen you use it on the blog and on in other interviews, talking about, it seems to me that the way you use it is like finding the place where someone's widely, maybe even wildly different interests can come together into something where it connects with other people. That's really vague, but does that get at all what you mean by convergence? Um, definitely, in, in, in many different ways as well. I would say like, when I first started writing the blog, I didn't have that convergence point. I mean, that was the goal, but I definitely didn't have it because in the beginning, I was mostly writing about my own trips. And some people are interested in that, um, but not a huge audience. I mean, like people who are really interested in adventure travel or something they might be interested. But you know, but otherwise, I, I had a lot of people ask, like, you know, what, what does this do for me and how does this help me? And so those are very good questions, uh, which I didn't have a good answer to uh, in the beginning. And so I think like you know, over time, as I as I listened to people, as I engaged more, and as the profile kind of grew a little bit, that's when I understood more about this concept. Where you know, uh, it's it's great to pursue your own dreams, but you have to find a way. You know, if you want to build a platform, if you want to reach more people, then then uh, you know, it has to it, it has to to intersect with other people's interests as well. And I say the same thing in, in like my small business work, or whenever I talk to people who are interested in starting businesses. You know, they have different ideas, uh, you know, of something that they're passionate about or a skill that they have that they want to transfer to a business. The first question I always ask is, um, OK, it's great that you're passionate about this. Um, we need to look and see who else is passionate about it and who is actually willing to exchange money, you know, in, in return for, for what you can offer. So I like to say that I'm, I'm really passionate about playing video games, but I've never found anyone willing to pay me you know, to do that. <laughs> So, the, the, but the trick is, you know, most of us are passionate about many different things. So we have to find something. If we, if our goal is to start a business, we have to find something that we're interested in, we're excited about, but other people also are interested in. So that's usually a long a long process for most people. This fascinates me a lot because there was actually this one phrase I read you use, and I wrote it down. I liked it so much. You talked about finding what you care about that other people care about. And it's really simple, but I think it's often forgotten. What was the process for you of, of finding what you care about that others also care about? And in as many numbers as you have readers. I committed to a, a schedule. I said, you know, like I'm going to have the, the blog three times a week. I, I definitely wanted to have a schedule because I saw a lot of people start blogs that kind of started with a bang and then kind of fizzled out. So I said, like, just for my own discipline, you know, I want to make sure that I do this, going to write a thousand words a day, Maybe not all of them are going to, be for, going to be for publication. Not all of them will be great or whatever, but I'm just going to make sure I maintain this discipline. And, you know, over the, over the course of the year, as I hear from people, as I connect with people, I mean, people post comments on the site every day. Um, you know, every day I'm getting tons of email, just kind of hearing different perspectives. It's not always, um, it's not always constructive criticism either. I mean, definitely have benefited from that. But I, I would say one of the things that has really benefited me the most is, is hearing the stories of people who read the blog. Because people uh, write in from all over the world and they share uh, often quite personal stories of, of their own lives, of how they have challenged authority or somehow done something differently. Whenever I read their stories, which come from this you know, wide array of perspectives, I always think, uh, you know, I'm always like, you know, flattered and honored that that person's actually reading the blog. And, and sometimes I, I think of them when I'm writing the next post or when I'm preparing something. And I think, you know, how is that person going to going to respond. Is this good enough for them? Because, you know, they're in this situation or they've made this difficult choice and, and they're a Peace Corps volunteer or they're an entrepreneur um, or they've just, you know, quit their job or started a new job or gone back to school or quit to quit school or made some big decision. So, you know, long story short, I just, I find myself challenged by the stories of the people um, who are, you know, reading the blog and engaging with it. And then I think over time, as you write, as you produce a radio show or whatever it is you do, um, just the more you do it, the, the better you get at it by just simply by doing it over and over. Now, can we can we conceive of the thing that you care about, that other people care about, as broadly as saying you and other people both care about living life differently than most people live it? I mean, is that accurate enough, a way to frame it? Well, it, it is a bit broad like that. So I do try to get more specific, you know, with the book and, and the blog. But at the same time, I've, I've also learned to not, not to put people in a box so much. Um, especially when you're writing about nonconformity and unconventional living, you know, um, I, I try to be really careful about not telling people what to do um, and and providing a space for for whatever that means. Now, of course, I have some some guidelines. I mean, I think you know our our, our dreams can't harm someone else. Um, I think most of us actually want to make a difference in the world. So I write a lot about that how how our dreams can intersect with you know making the world a better place. But uh, at the same time, I would also say like I've tried to deliberately get in some ways less specific um, as I've gone gone on because uh, in the beginning, I remember when we were first pitching my my book to publishers and they asked about the target market. 
And I said, the target market is people who want to change the world. And, you know, I was told that's not really a target market. A target market is women age 30 to 34 with a college <laughs> degree, you know, or something like that, which I understand in traditional business terms. But I also knew that that wasn't really aligned with my audience because the audience is very international. Um, the audience ranges a great deal in age. I mean, I've got senior citizens. I've got high school students. You know, I've got people from all different, all different perspectives. So it's more like a psychographic, you know, targeting than it is a, a demographic targeting, if that makes sense. And that's something that maybe publishers are catching on to, considering your book. It's your book is is published. It's it's uh being it's a real thing. That seems like you eventually were able to to push through this concept of psychographic uh, uh, an audience in that sense. Yeah, it makes sense now. I mean, it's one of those things like you know, once you achieve some degree of success, then everyone's like, oh, of course, you know, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, but in the beginning, you know, we we pitched the book, and we, just like just like a lot of first time authors, we pitched the book, and ten publishers turn it down, and one publisher is interested, and 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 that's that's how it goes. There was a great moment in the book reading it that you mentioned your favorite novelist, who also happens to be one of my favorite novelists, Haruki Murakami. And you talk about his book, what I talk about when I talk about running a recent a recent memoir of his, and you talk about his his relationship to the audience, how he conceives of his relationship to his audience and how important he, how much he's prioritized it. I mean, how do you, what do you take from Murakami and the way he does things? Yeah, I definitely am a big uh, Murakami fan. I think I've read most of his work that's been translated. Um, I think in that passage, I was talking about a, a specific choice that he made in terms of prioritizing his relationship with the audience and, uh, and almost deliberately choosing you know, to turn down a lot of social engagements. Um, so, you know, he's committed to his wife, of course, and, uh, you know, a small, a small intimate circle of friends, but um, he doesn't do a lot. He doesn't make a lot of other commitments. He doesn't do a lot of social things. Um, and he talks about how people find that unusual. Um, but he says, basically, like, I have to, you know, shouldn't I, as a novelist, I think he said, uh, shouldn't I prioritize my relationship with the, with the readers, you know, the readers who support me, the readers who care about this, um, and so on. So it's kind of like a deliberate choice to, you know, define your relationship to a broad group of people as opposed to, you know, a very small uh, group of people. And that's something I've definitely thought about. It's like, okay, every day, you know, people all over the world are, are reading and participating in one way or another. Like, I really, really want to make that a, a priority um, in my communication, a priority in my time. You know, and when I decide, like, what kind of projects I'm doing, I definitely want to, to think about them as opposed to thinking of a, of a smaller group. So you think of your audience, your small army of readers, as the back of the book calls it. And you think about that as being one of the most important relationships you have, I guess. So it's, it's like a, it's like a two way thing that's always on your mind. They support you, you support them. And there's just, it's kind of a, it's kind of a loop that you try to continue and maybe enlarge. And, and how do you think of it? Uh, you know, I always think that basically the, the site exists, you know, the whole platform exists, the book, the, the network, the community, the business. I mean, everything really does come from, from the small army of remarkable people, as I call them. And I, I've been grateful to have the support of, of some influential people along the way. And that's great. I really appreciate that. Um, but ultimately, you know, the, this, the message of the site has spread, you know, just from, from all kinds of ordinary people without a lot of influence um, who are excited about it and are posting about it on Facebook or on Twitter or, uh, you know, writing about it on their blog. And so I guess from the beginning, I kind of had a strategy that I never wanted to distance myself from that. I never wanted to kind of create... Uh, you know, barriers, unnecessary barriers, you know, between myself and, and that group of people. So, you know, I still do all my own email and I'm, I'm really happy to do that. Um, I don't have a lot of assistance or staff or anything like that. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I guess I always just kind of like, I try to give back. I think um, I'll, I'll share a quote with you from Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, hopefully it doesn't sound bad to me. It, it makes perfect sense. But I heard that Gary was speaking in Phoenix and um, people ask him something like, you know, how have you been able to achieve such success? I mean, how have you got such a platform? Because you're talking about wine, but other people talk about wine and you have this, you know, internet show, but lots of people do. So, so what is the secret? And he said, really, the secret is I love my people more. He said, I, I basically, I, I just love them. And I try to, you know, I try to keep the focus on them as much as possible. And so I heard that quote and I was like, I, I really identify with it. That's kind of, that's that's the approach that, that I want to take as well. And, and again, I hope it doesn't sound bad or fake or anything. It's something that's very, very genuine. And I know it is genuine for Gary. And so I try to apply the same thing myself. 
It is a fascinating quote, but it also brings to mind something that I think about a lot in terms of the way a lot of people have have carried on their online ventures, especially blogs, things like that, where where them communicating with a, a wide, at least by the standard of a blog audience, is important. And you know, Gary Vaynerchuk's a good example, but. How do you or do you think about the fact that you want to keep you don't want to lose yourself, if you know what I mean? You don't want to simply be a mirror reflecting an audience back to themselves, because at that point, you know, why Why are you? The question becomes, why am I doing it and not just anybody? Does that ever come to mind? Uh, sure, I think so. I think there's a tension. I think there's a natural tension and a natural balance. And, and uh, um, a leader has to be able to put forward a message and a leader has to be able to put forward some kind of agenda, understanding that, you know, not everyone's going to like the agenda or whatever. So, so yes, I think that's something that I, I've kind of gone back and forth with over time. Uh, we mentioned Seth Godin earlier before the, the broadcast. When I met with Seth last year uh, in New York, I said, Seth, you know, uh, tell me one thing you think I can do better. I know it's a long list, but just give me one thing. And uh, he was very kind. He said, oh, it's not, a, it's not a long list. You're doing great, Chris, but I think you need a little bit more of an agenda because consensus is overrated. So that was a very Seth kind of thing to say, and I, I really like that. So I've been thinking a lot about, about that over the past year, just getting ready for the book to come out and getting ready to go out on the road and thinking like, okay, what, what is the agenda? What is the message? Um, because people do read the site for a reason. They, they do want to know like what I think about different things. So, so I would say that's kind of a, that's something that I, I've, I've been working towards for this fall. And you bring up Seth Godin, and he, of course, was on this show not too long ago. We were talking about his book, Lynchpin, and a lot of resonances seem to happen, at least for me, between his book and yours. Because I think of what I talked to Seth about, we talked about how... If you follow a lot of the, the recommendations in his book, Lynchpin, you might seem to some people somewhat uh, somewhat insane. And I put quotes around that. And he says, well, you know, the way things are today, the insane people or the people who get called insane, I think they're the sane people. Do you have similar sentiments? Sure, of course. And Seth has been a huge influence on me. I was reading his books uh, when I was in Africa. And so it was really great to kind of start this project and come full circle and then, you know, get to know him. And, and Seth is also an example of the kind of person where, you know, he's very accessible to his readers, even though his readership is, is much larger than mine and everyone else's. So, um, yeah, I think I, w- I would say a whole part of the message in the movement is, is about questioning assumptions and questioning, you know, conventional expectations and how we should live our lives. And so it, it's kind of ironic because now there's a, there's a large group of people basically saying that, you know, the sane way was was insane. And I, and I see it happening throughout, uh, you know, all kinds of, of different walks of life from a lot of consideration about mortgages now, for example, like New York Times is having all these articles, you know, showing how uh, mortgages aren't appreciating and maybe they never will again in the same way. And, uh, you know, now it's it's somewhat fashionable to suggest that renting a home is is um, just as an intelligent decision as owning a home in some cases, uh, whereas a few years ago, that was very unusual you know, unusual belief. So that's just one example, but I kind of see it like, you know, throughout society that, that a lot of these assumptions are being questioned. So it's an interesting dynamic when things kind of change and, and there's almost more people on your side than against you. Now, with what you've read, with how you've communicated with people who read you and others, with the conversations you've had, tell me, do you get a sense that that people are more dissatisfied with sort of the traditional ways lives have been conducted in Western, you know, Western, the Western world than ever, or the developed world, I should say, is there more dissatisfaction with the sort of normal, uh, the normal um, template than ever? I think so. Um, But again, I I kind of preach to the choir, you know, Um, I'm not really, uh, I'm not on a message, I'm not on a mission to persuade anybody about anything. For the most part, I'm recruiting, I'm not evangelizing. So it's a key distinction. I'm not trying to really argue with anyone. I'm, I'm just pro- trying to, to provide a, an alternative or maybe even not provide the alternative, but just be an amplifier, you know, for the alternative. So so with that disclaimer out of the way, I would say that, um, you know, I just hear more and more stories of people um, who who are dissatisfied, more, more and more stories who are maybe disappointed. They went down a traditional um, traditional college track, maybe a grad school track, maybe a career track, and then discovered that that wasn't you know, what they had hoped for. And so there's two things. There's one, there's a discovery that things were disappointing or weren't what they hoped for. Or they didn't have the job security, career security that they, they expected. But then also um, they're seeing that there's an alternative. So you can't just be disappointed. You also have to you know, see some kind of alternative or else you'll just be discouraged. So I think I think the exciting thing is people are are, are becoming dissatisfied uh, and discontented, but they're also, you know, finding new ways to, to do things and new ways to, to make a living and not just make a living, but also to have a life. So that, that's really exciting to me. 
What do you think was different about the sort of setting that your life went on in early on that made you come to the point where you opted for nonconformity, you know, when you did rather than 20 years down the road when you realized, you know, I have this career and I have this mortgage. It's not it's not too fulfilling. What helped you realize earlier on that you had a different way to go? Mm. Well, I would say right from the beginning, my dad was very helpful. I mean, I had a very good um, you know, upbringing with my dad and, and uh, my stepmother. And then also I had another family as well, which was helpful in some cases. But my dad was really good in terms of uh, encouraging independent thinking. Um, we used to go to bookstores and I always liked to read for, you know, as, as from a young age. And uh, my dad wasn't spectacularly well off, but I remember going to bookstores and I could pick out whatever books I wanted. I could bring like eight books to him and he would, he would uh, pay for them. And the books might be on this, you know, huge array of topics and he wouldn't even look at the titles. He'd be like, Oh, that's great. You know, and he would really support me and that. And so it's kind of funny because as a kid, you think that's normal and you think, you know, every parent is like that. And then of course you grow up and you realize that's quite a, that's quite an abnormal, um, but incredibly supportive thing. So it was great to be encouraged in independent thinking as a kid. I think, um, I had a very unusual college experience and that also helped in the sense that I didn't really learn much in college, but I did kind of like, you know, go through this accelerated process of attending multiple institutions all at once to try to get my degree as quickly as possible. Probably not the smartest thing in retrospect, <laughs> uh, but it was fun at the time. And, it, you know, it, it, kind of set, it kind of set a foundation for everything that came later, later, for better or worse. Now, I want to get an idea of what it took to convert your the way you've lived your life. I mean, your life itself, converting it or using it as material for a book that recommends certain things to people. I don't even know if recommends is the right word, but a book that frames, that reframes life for people to look at their own lives differently. I mean, how do you, how do you go about knowing what in your life is a good raw material to use to make suggestions to other people? Does that make any sense? I mean, how do you know what material will apply in a wider sense? Yes, it makes perfect sense. That's the, that's the challenge. I would, that's, that is the challenge. Um, you know, that I faced with writing this book. And I don't, I mean, other people will, will be the judge of whether, whether I succeeded or not. But the challenge is like, you know, how not to write a prescriptive kind of thing. Like, here's what I do. So therefore you should do this. Um, while at the same time, not being too generic or vague, you know? Um, so I think, I think what I tried to do, the way I approached that challenge was, okay, um, one, I'm, I'm going to tell my story because people are interested in the story for whatever reason. Um, but I'm also going to tell a number of other stories. And so I'm going to I'm going to look at my life and I'm going to say, here are the choices that I faced. Um, here is the life that I forged. Um, here are the decisions that I made in terms of, you know, how to find a way to make a living, um, how I how I started traveling, um, the volunteer aspect, um, the college aspect. I mean, all these kind of things. Here's what I did. Um, you know, take what works for you, discard what doesn't. Um, but then also, you know, here are the, here are the stories of a number of other people um, who, have, who have made courageous choices or have somehow, you know, um, come up against something and found an alternative or an unconventional way around it. So, um, I, I mean, the question is whether I found the right balance or not. I mean, I feel, I feel good about it, but ultimately, you know, we'll, the, the readers will decide. How much has hearing the stories of your readers, getting more information about them and sort of examining the choices they make as they tell you about them, how much has that helped you in your own life? Have you been able to use these examples that you've gotten from people looking to you as an example and then sort of work them back into the way you're tackling sort of the challenges you set up for yourself? Definitely. And one good example is um, this thing of, of having children and traveling um, because I, I am married, but we don't have any children. And so often, uh, you know, people write in and say like, oh, well, I want to, to live this unconventional life, but I've got two kids or, you know, we can't do this because we have a baby or whatever. And so it's almost like, you know, for a long time, I'm like, well, how can I respond to that? Because it's true. I don't have children. Maybe, maybe in fact, you know, maybe in fact, once you have children, then in fact, uh, you know, you know, you'll never be able to travel again because I don't, I don't know for sure. But then, you know, I started hearing from lots and lots of families, you know, from all over the world, from missionary families or aid worker families. Um, or families who have just decided um, basically they they want something different than than um, raising their kids in America. And so um, there's a, there's a family I think they're currently in in Spain, um, Jean and Dee, and I wrote about them in the book. And they have a uh, they had a three year old. I think she's now six. So for three years they've been traveling, um, living on about twenty four thousand dollars a year, going to all these different countries. I'm um, basically kind of doing what I'm doing, but you know at, with with the family. And there there's some other examples too, but. But now when people ask that question, I'm like, oh, well, you're right. I can't answer that myself. But, you know, I encourage you to, to look, at, um, look at this family or look at what these people did. Um, you know, and it's also a nice deflector when, you know, whenever, um, you know, you know, whenever you receive criticism and people say it's impossible. I say, well, 
you know, maybe it's difficult, but, you know, other people have been able to do it. So that's one example. But I think, um, you know, in many cases, I've been able to kind of like think about my readers and, and refer them to different people. And as you're writing for people like this, people who want to break out of the conventional life and for an unconventional one, people who want to stop conforming, the people who have an especially or have had an especially hard time doing so before, do you think or do you get an idea if there's any slant toward one of these or the other? Do you think that they conceive of a non-conventional life as being more difficult than it is to execute? Or do you think they think that they themselves are less suited to it than they may actually be? I, I don't know if I phrased that but do, well, but do you think it's more about the way they think of the tasks ahead and the way they overestimate them or the way they underestimate themselves? Mm, that's, that's a very good question. Um, we, could probably, we could probably talk about that for a long time. I guess, uh, I, guess I tend to think that um, one of the biggest barriers is definitely fear and uncertainty and people you know, looking from the outside in, do do perceive, you know, making making uh, choices to be more difficult than it actually is. I mean, one of the things, probably one of the main objections, one of the main concerns that people often have, um, the situation always varies, but the concern is, uh, what will people think of me? Uh, or I don't think my family will support this. Or I wanted to go and do this trip, for example, um, or take this job or whatever, um, but I know that my my traditional family or whatever will not you know, will, will not support me. So I think probably one of the things that's been helpful is, you know, kind of talking with people about how over time people do get used to those kind of things. Like in my case, um, I remember when I moved back to the States, uh, I think some of my family thought I was in the States to stay. And uh, one time they called Jolie, my wife, and, and Jolie is like, oh, Chris is in Vietnam. And my parents are like, Vietnam, what is he doing in Vietnam? You know, and they're kind of like, you know, worried or something. And that was maybe two years ago, you know, and then I started doing the thing where I was in 25 countries a year. And uh, now like they have no idea where they send me an email. They're like, Chris, we're not sure what continent you're on, but you know, <laughs> here's what we wanted to know or something. And, uh, and, and no one's concerned. So I think one of the things I try to say is whatever it is you're, you're doing, whatever the choice is always difficult in the beginning, but it does get better, you know, over time. And people do get used to, to, um, to what you're doing over time. And maybe they, they'll actually be challenged in it themselves and maybe they'll actually be encouraged in it themselves you know, to make maybe not the same choice, but some other difficult choice for them. If you've just tuned in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm Colin Marshall. My guest is Chris Gillibeau. He's a blogger, an entrepreneur, and the author of The Art of Nonconformity, both the blog and the new book. If you want to hear this conversation again, it's easy. Visit ColinMarshallRadio.com and go to the complete Marketplace of Ideas interview archive. Lots of other fun stuff there as well. And please do let me know any feedback you have, questions, comments as well, absolutely anything. Feel free to send that along to Colin, C-O-L-I-N, at ColinMarshallRadio.com. That's Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. This fear about what will people think of me, it, it does seem to be an even more prevalent fear than I think it would initially seem, and it initially seems pretty prevalent. Now, you get you talk about in your book that you get some criticism, you know, probably off the sidelines on the net, but you still get some some lines like, oh, you know, this this Chris Gillibo is not living in the real world. He's, he's, he doesn't think about what people actually have to do. And I, I assume this comes in maybe not at a huge volume, but fairly regularly. Uh, did, does it bother you? Does it, does it hurt at all that people that people have these comments? Or is there... Is there anything to be learned from them? Well, I think maybe both. I mean, I think uh, I think you can be hurt by something and still learn from it. Um, so I would definitely say I'm not immune to it. I would definitely say, like, you know, I can hear 99 nice things one day and then, and then one not so nice thing. And the not so nice thing is going to bother me, <laughs> even though I know that even though I know it's totally irrational. Like, I would love to get over that. Um, but no, I haven't really figured out a way to, um, you know, to be immune to that. Um, I've seen some people that, that um, at least my perception is that they're immune to that kind of thing. And I, and I respect that. Um, but I, I don't quite have that myself. I often think of, uh, of Malcolm Gladwell. Um, I read his blog, which is really interesting because I, I love Malcolm Gladwell's books. And then I read his blog and his blog appears to be like, for the most part, it's, it's almost like a defense of criticism. Mm. And his blog is like, Oh, so-and-so says this, well, here's the real story. And, um, and I, it's almost like, um, I can perceive, you know, that he's a little bit sensitive over it, which is fascinating because he's Malcolm Gladwell, you know, and, he writes these these incredible books, um, but yet he still seems, um, you know, quite threatened um, by the criticism. So I think if he hasn't figured it out, maybe I never will uh, figure it out. But, you know, the second part of your question, can something be learned? Definitely. Um, and I think it's always good to try to look and see what the core motivation is. You know, what's the core, what's the root of that criticism? Uh, maybe someone... 
Maybe someone is just projecting something, some some experience of their own. Um, or maybe maybe it's true that I didn't really consider, you know, the angle that they were talking about. Another thing that's helped me is I have learned to kind of preempt objections a little bit um, and just try to think like when I write, like what are what are going to be the concerns to this and what are the objections? And uh, maybe I can't counter them all. There's certainly room for other perspectives or criticisms, but I can try to you know think in think in advance what the objections are going to be, and if I can answer those a little bit in the, the essay or the post or the book or whatever, then I think that kind of reduces the level of criticism. Yeah, there's this great word for that. I always forget. I think it's prolepsis. Prolepsis. That's that's it. It's uh, it's a good thing to get into. But um, now I want to uh, I want to also get into another element of the way that the way that you relate with other people, and it's something that I think. I think readers tend to be surprised by is that you claim to uh, you claim to be an introvert. How how surprised are people by that? Because it certainly surprised me. Uh, yeah, some people are surprised. I don't I don't really know why they're surprised. I guess uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's because I mean the classic definition of introvert or extrovert is where you get your energy from, right? Mm. So uh, I tend to get my energy more from being by myself and just kind of recharging. And I do enjoy. Like I do enjoy social events and the, the meetups and things that I've been doing, but I also feel like really tired at the end. I feel like I need to go and sleep for three days um, or, or whatever. So that's that's why I think I'm I'm more introverted. But I've also learned, um, you know, talking about fear a little bit. You know, I, I have a fear of public speaking, like a lot of people do. I have a fear of uh, not really a fear or a phobia, but I, you know, I don't necessarily like to to be around large groups all the time. And uh, one of the things I've learned is I don't let fear make my decisions for me, at least as much as possible. Um, so, so that's why, like when I was thinking about doing uh, the book tour that I'm going to do, I was like, what's the biggest possible book tour I could like, what could I put together that would be the most epic kind of thing? That's when I came up with the idea of visiting all 50 States, you know, all 10 provinces in Canada, doing this all kind of like, you know, on my own without a lot of support from the publisher. Like on the one hand, it scares me to death. Um, and on the other hand, it just sounds, it sounds epic. It sounds fun. It sounds like a good story. And, and, uh, it's the kind of thing that I think is going to tire me out um, in, in many different ways, but I also think it's going to be worth it. And I'll look back on it with good memories, you know, so, so I am definitely introverted, but, you know, I've found a way to kind of work with it. This is a concept I've thought a lot about, and only now does it become a little clearer to me. Does, does taking on a task that is, as we say, epic, does the epicness at a certain point make it, make the task not necessarily easier, but makes it something you're more inclined to jump into, more inclined to give yourself over to? I mean, there are regular hard things that don't present a lot of, that, that don't present that epicness. And maybe those are actually harder to do in a certain sense because they're harder to build up the excitement about, about the excitement of a kind of achievement. Yeah, I, I like to say nothing worth doing is ever easy. And uh, and I know people will, some people kind of pick that apart and they find different examples and stuff. So I'm sure you can find examples. But but I think uh, the epic nature of, of it creates a meaning, creates a challenge and, a, and it creates, yeah, I think creates meaning is the best way to put it. And so visiting every country in the world, at least in my case, you know, where I was where something where I find personal meaning and uh, there are a lot of challenges in it. And a lot of times that I feel like giving up or feel like doing something different, but because of the, because of the goal, because it is, you know, epic, as we say, at least it's, it's epic to me. Um, other people have to judge, but um, then it's something that kind of helps you keep going because of the story, you know, not just not the story in a PR sense or a marketing sense, but the story in like a, it's just the, the heroic nature of it or the long lasting nature of it, even if no one else ever knows about it or cares about it. Like when you can find personal meaning in something that's really difficult, some kind of quest, then I think, um, you know, it definitely, it definitely helps you keep going when things are hard. There's this element in the book. One of the, one of the particularly fascinating things I thought was you talk about the idea of what you call life experiments, and you do attribute that to someone else as well. But it was really fascinating the way you described it because I think something like a life experiment, periodically, you know, saying to yourself, "What would happen if I did this, or if I lived this way, or for this time period, I put myself to this sort of test." I I think of it as being like a way to keep life exciting by always, in some sense putting yourself to the test. Is that what you look for in life? I mean, do you always want to be putting yourself to some sort of test, even if it's maybe an easier one than, than some you've done? Do you always want to have that just see what I can do element? I hope so. I think, I think routine is dangerous, at least routine, you know, over time, uh, you know, when we get comfortable with things, then that's what the whole idea of the life experiment is about. And that actually comes from, from one of our readers, Alan Bacon. And he talked about, um, 
you know, life experience as life experiments as being something that can be very small in the beginning. So he talked about like going to an art museum during his lunch hour. Um, and that was just something he had never really done before. At least, you know, he might go to an art museum when he's on vacation or something with his family, but he wouldn't like take his lunch hour and go and do that. So that's a very, very small example, but he talked about, you know, how, how it came with kind of a shift in perspective and that life experiment led to taking up a new hobby of photography. And that led to, um, traveling to Paris a few times on business trips. And then he moved his, his family, you know, for a few weeks to, um, to Paris for an extended trip. So that's kind of a bigger thing. Um, I definitely think, you know, as we, as we take risks, even if they're small risks, you know, or, you know, seemingly meaningless uh, risks, they may in fact, you know, serve as some kind of catalyst for something else, or at least make life a little bit more exciting. Whether it's it's moving to Paris for a few weeks or whether it's doing a all states and Canadian provinces book tour or, you know, whether it's traveling to every country in the world, are these things that you can you can convince people um, are worth doing or are they things that you have to that only people who already know that they're worth doing or have come to that conclusion or have gotten ready to believe that will come to you and want to know more? Uh, the, the distinction, I guess, is more like, is it is this something that you're saying, here's why this is worthwhile and, you know, believe me on this one? Or is it like, you already believe this, now I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you that you've come to the right conclusion on this? I would say it's probably a little bit closer to the second. I think uh, for the first thing, um, you know, probably it's true that some people are, are challenged by different ideas and they hear it and they think, oh, that's, that's interesting. I've never considered that before. And so maybe it opens something. But I would say uh, I tend to hear much more of the second where, you know, there are, there are plenty of people out there and some of them have written me from time to time and saying, like, I think visiting every country in the world is a dumb idea. And so I always say, that's great. I, I wish well, you know, because I'm not doing it for you. <laughs> no offense. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it primarily for my own, own motivations. And uh, I, I think, you know, people already have a mindset whether they like that kind of thing or, or not. I mean, I was in New York City recently just on a quick stopover and I was in uh, Washington Square Park. And I met a guy uh, playing piano there. He brought his piano into Washington Square Park. And then I get to know a little bit about him. Uh, his name is Colin Huggins. And he's been in the New York Times and the Village Voice and all these things. Uh, and he's relatively well known for carrying this piano all over New York City. And he's brought the piano into the Manhattan subway and, you know, all of these all of these crazy places. And it, the articles talk about how he physically has to, you know, cart the piano around uh, Manhattan and where he stores it and all that. So that's an example where when I meet the guy who has the, who carts the piano around New York City, I think that's amazing. Like I just think that's that's crazy and, and epic, and I think it's really fun. And you know, I want to support his work, and obviously a lot of other people do too. But it's also the kind of thing that's very polarizing because other people think, well, what's the big deal in that? Like, can he just get a real job if he wants to play piano? Why can't he just go play in a bar? Couldn't he carry a synthesizer? You know. So I, I think there's different mindsets, and and I'm more interested in connecting with people who are like, wow, that's 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 awesome. That sounds really really fun. There's something I just have to ask about here. People actually write to you to say, I think traveling to every country is a dumb idea, and that's the whole reason they wrote? Uh, that's correct. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's a huge amount of people, but uh, definitely definitely hear from people who, I mean, the thing is, what, what you have to realize is, is travel travel is something people are very, very opinionated about. And so I, I know that. Um, and so, I mean, I think people, some people have judgments that, uh, you know, if you're if you're not in a country for years and years, then you're not able, able to know something about it or whatever. Now, obviously, I disagree with that. Um, but yeah, yeah, people have people have different value judgments and, and that's fine. So I try to kind of explain my perspective on the blog. I've got to frequently ask questions. Um, I try to say, like, I'm not trying to be an expert on every place in the world. Obviously not. Um, I'm more interested in, in you know, travel, um, travel as a as a goal by itself. And, you know, but but yes, people do do say that. And you're kind of at the intersection of two worlds as well. You know, you've got the travelers and you've got the entrepreneurs as well. And there are a lot of young entrepreneurs who've gotten very vocal on the net. I mean, do you think of yourself as being in the middle of those two worlds? Is, is, there, is there any sort of distinctive perspective you get with those two audiences at once? Um, sure. And one of the things that's helped me um, is I didn't really... I wasn't hyper specific, you know, about the, the site and the project um, in the beginning. And even now, like it's I mean, the, the tagline is unconventional strategies for life, work and travel. Um, now, you know, some marketing people would say that, you know, that's that's a mistake because it's not a niche. You know, that's very broad, et cetera. Um, but, you know, for me, it, it was just a question like, you know, I'm an ADD person. I'm an entrepreneur who's always done a bunch of different stuff. I, I like different things. So I don't want to pigeonhole myself. Um, so, yeah, writing about the travel and the small business and then you know, also other related topics, um, just motivation in general, 
um, I would say I would say it's helped and and it's fun to kind of it's fun to have the different audiences. It's fun to have you know the audience that's more interested in the business side or whatever. Um, and 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 it's also a challenge, right? Because I have to kind of think like, okay, how can I how can I not alienate anyone that I don't wish to alienate? Um, but so that's part of the fun. With all the culture of lifestyle design, as we've called it, and as it often gets called, that's popped up recently in the last few years, you know, you've got very big stars in this, like Tim Ferriss and Leo from Zen Habits. It's become a big thing on the net. And is is this is this a culture or a subculture within which you feel like you actively have to distinguish yourself to set yourself apart from the others? Or is it something that you just kind of have been distinguished in and you don't necessarily sweat that? I, I would say I, w- I don't really sweat it. I mean, I, I think uh, I think there's there's space for a lot of different voices and a lot of different perspectives. And that's one of the beautiful things about um, blogging and globalization and the Internet in general is, is that um, different readers can be attracted, uh, you know, to different voices and different personalities. So I, I would say, um, I mean, I'm friends with with, you know, those people you mentioned, and I do keep up with what other people are doing. But I actually I don't always read what what some of the other blogs are saying just because I want to you know, make sure that I have some kind of original voice and, and some kind of original perspective. But um, I would say also about competition is one thing I don't really, uh, I don't really worry about competition or anything like that, just because, you know, it's a, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a big world out there and, and I've got a readership and other people have readerships and anyone can start a blog tomorrow and, and have their own, their own voice and their own audience. And they're probably going to say some things that, that are different and better than what I would say. And so other people will be attracted to them. So it's kind of like a, an expanding the pie concept where I think like, you know, we don't have to worry about fighting over pieces of the pie. I think the pie is just going to get bigger and more people are going to be attracted to the so-called movement. And, and that's great for everyone. And when it came time to translate these efforts of yours into a book, you know, this book, this book, The Art of Nonconformity, conformity, same name, but a whole different form, uh, something you have to, I don't know whether it requires, I guess, how much rethinking of what you were doing does it require to arrange it into something completely different from a blog and everything else you were doing into this very traditional form, um, almost almost not it's not necessarily a motivational book but it is a book that does motivate you how do you how did you go about fitting yourself into this into this type of work yes uh, well it was difficult because uh, as you say i'm used to writing a blog and then you know to go to writing writing long form i mean i I had written some long form things before i'd written a master's thesis you know i had written some manifestos that are maybe 30 to 40 pages or so long but that's that's quite different from a 250 page book so it was it was definitely something that that uh, took some getting used to. I don't think I'm a natural you know a natural book author. It was definitely a, you know a lot of work of, of sitting down and like what would I really want to say? And I don't want to reuse anything from the blog for the most part. I want it to be at least ninety percent new. Um, so I, I mean I think I went through like the usual author anguish of just kind of have to lock yourself in a room and, and get it done. But the other thing that's interesting about publishing is it takes so long. You know like it takes almost a year to write a book. And then it takes, it takes uh, a year after that for the book to come out. So the, the, the timeline is a little bit, you know, a little bit difficult because I, I'm reading the book now and I'm like, oh, I wrote this a year ago. And, <laughs> and uh, some, some things I'm happy with and other things I think, oh, my, maybe I would say that a little bit differently now. But, you know, uh, like Seth Godin says, at a certain point, you just have to ship. You have to deliver and an artist has to put something out there and then go on to the next thing. So that's what I'm doing. Are there any advantages you find in a form like a book where you have to you have to keep it a little more timeless because this thing is going to be around for a while. People are going to be reading it for a very long time. Copies will be around, you know, as long as books are around. Uh, is, was there an advantage in keeping in the mindset that what I write down here should have a longer sh- or can have a longer shelf life than on a blog? Yes, I hope so. And I mean, that's, that's the goal. I mean, the goal is to create something relatively timeless. Um, the goal is to create a souvenir, you know, of something that can be, you know, like it's a physical thing. I mean, of course, it's, it's a digital version as well. But I mean, it's a, a book is something that, you know, hopefully has a little bit longer life than a blog post. I mean, one of the other motivations was, um, I, like, I can't think of a lot of blog posts, however well written by whoever, um, that have really like changed my life in a fundamental way. Um, but I can think of a number of books that have, you know, um, I mean, Murakami's work, um, you know, as a novelist has, has really been influential to me. Um, you know, Man's Search for Meaning or Mountains Beyond Mountains. Um, a lot of these kind of books have really like made an impact and caused, uh, you know, a big shift in my life. And so I'm thinking like not necessarily saying that that's what my book is going to do for everyone, of course, but that's the goal. I mean, the goal is to write something that's really fundamentally going to you know, transform someone's relationship with with life and work. And, and I'm not sure that a blog post can do that. So 
So as to whether that's the case or not, I guess I guess we'll we'll find out. You once described your life, I believe, in another interview pretty concisely in a way that I quite enjoyed, which is that your life is writing and connecting with people. And tell me if I'm if I have this right, but do you consider that to be the core of whatever you do whenever you're doing it, you're you're writing and you're connecting? Yeah, I think that's good. I might add something about adventure in there somewhere um, in terms of not just the travel, but trying to, again, trying to tell a good story with my life in terms of, uh, you know, just going on big things like to every country in the world or the the book tour, you know, or other things I might do in the future. But I, I like that, writing and connecting. And with something like travel, you know, you, you think how much fun it must be to do when you're someone who hasn't traveled much and reading a book like yours. And you think what the possibilities are for that. But then... It seems like it seems on one hand that traveling is in its way a way to connect with people because you can do that. You can connect with people, you know, you're not much like when you're traveling around the world. You can get experience with that. You can connect connect with people by your stories about your travel, but there's got to be a part of it isn't there that's just that's purely internal that that that, that changes the way you think that kind of modifies your brain travel does. Uh, is that any way at all like you think of it? Um definitely, absolutely. And I would say that that some of my, it's one of those things that's not always politically correct to say, but some of the, some of the, um, the best travel experiences I've had have, have been completely on my own, just, um, you know, not with people, but in a, in a place maybe where I don't even speak the language. So I can't talk to a lot of people and I'm just kind of, you know, um, trying to sort, sort myself out and go through whatever I need to do to survive in this place and go on to the next place or whatever. So there's definitely an internal, an internal motivation, an internal reward of, working through the challenges and then having a good experience. Um, I remember being in Zimbabwe and just watching the the sunset and thinking like, this is, this is really remarkable that I get to do this. And, and it's, what's remarkable is it's not like a, it's not like the fulfillment of a lifetime dream, you know, where, you know, I've saved for 10 years or something to make this happen. It's more like, this is, this is what I do as part of my life on a regular basis. So yeah, I would say there's a lot of personal meaning to it. And how much, how important is it, whether you're traveling, whether you're, whether you're writing books, whether you're doing volunteer work, whether you're doing philanthropy, any of the tasks you do, you know, especially if they're epic ones, how much, how much of it is important to you that just to get the idea in your head that it's something you can do, that to get the idea that it's, that when you've done something, that automatically sort of widens your view on what your own abilities are. I mean, do you, do you just enjoy the, the sheer sort of, knowing what is possible for you is is that a big element of these things you do just seeing where your own limits are sure i think so and and seeing where the limits are and seeing how you can go beyond the limits like we talked about like you know doing the meetups doing the speaking or whatever um or whatever our, our fears are trying to find a way to, to overcome them i think i think there's definitely uh, a beauty and a meaning in in um in pursuing big goals for the sake of themselves um or for pursuing a quest um another guy I like is uh is Thomas Hawk he's a photographer and, and uh his goal is to have 1 million processed uh photos um you know throughout his life and so basically he's like addicted to this idea that um you know he's got a day job he's a financial analyst or something in San Francisco but uh photography is his passion and his love and he spends you know all of his free time basically you know um, pursuing this goal. And so he loves photography. He loves the the skill and, and the craft and everything that's involved with it. But he also loves the idea of, of trying to push this limit and trying to, to reach this this goal. And so some people could say, well, that's an arbitrary thing. But to him, it has a lot of meaning. And it's also something where a lot of other people have come along and have looked at his work and said, oh, this is really fantastic. And, and I'm encouraged by this, too. It's like Colin and the piano, or maybe it's like Chris and every country in the world. Um, so I think it's really fun when you can do something that has that personal meaning that is a, a goal for its own sake, but yet other people also come alongside and say, like, that's that's something that encourages me or inspires me in some way. The name of the book, once again, is The Art of Nonconformity. Set your own rules, live the life you want, and change the world. Chris Gillibeau, thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks, Colin. I appreciate it. If you'd like to learn more about Chris Gillibeau and the art of nonconformity, visit Chris Gillibeau, that is Chris, G-U-I-L-L-E-B-E-A-U, dot com. This has been the Marketplace of Ideas. I've been Colin Marshall. You can hear the show again at ColinMarshallRadio.com, where the complete Marketplace of Ideas interview archive is kept. Or you can hear any show in the entire history of the program right there, any interview at your fingertips. Or on iTunes, if you search for the Marketplace of Ideas. You can find the website of the man who makes our theme music, Ben Althaus, at benalthaus.com. 
And if you have any feedback for me, stuff you want to hear more of, stuff you want to hear less of, guests to suggest, whatever you'd like, send that along to Colin, C-O-L-I-N, at ColinMarshallRadio.com. As always, thank you for listening, and we will catch you next time.